Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about old cats in shelters today. I've got a really creaky old ginger cat myself that actually walks really like that wind-up mechanical cat we had on the stage yesterday. Um, so I love old cats. Um, and we do have a lot of older cats coming into our shelters in the UK. Um, I don't know what the situation is in other places in Europe. Just move on to the overview. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to say may be from a sort of British perspective, but hopefully it can give you some thoughts and ideas, um, because I think overall we are seeing um, an ageing population of cats. They are living longer. So what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, some general issues and, that come up to do with all the cats in shelters. Then I'm going to say something about the common diseases in older cats. Um, I'm not trying to make you all into mini vets, but I think if you are having older cats in your shelters, you do need to understand a little bit about what sort of things you should be monitoring in these older cats so you can assess their health status and when to intervene. And I'm going to say something about assessing quality of life and then go on to some practical tips, um, just some little guidance points for you. So the first question is, how old is an elderly cat? Um, and I'd be really interested, I think, perhaps at the break, if, if you could tell me in your different countries what you consider an elderly cat to be. I don't know whether it is the same all over Europe. But certainly in a veterinary term, a geriatric cat is anything over the age of 10. Um, I've got two nine-year-old cats, and I must admit, I think of them as sort of middle-aged rather than heading towards um, becoming geriatrics. Um, and most people would tend to think of elderly cats being sort of 12 plus. And certainly in the UK, the average life expectancy of a cat, an owned cat, not a feral or a street cat, is about 14 years. But we're seeing many that are getting into their late teens and even into their 20s. But that average is really taking into account all the younger cats that are killed on the roads or, or die of other things. Now, the cat in the picture is a cat called Lucy. And she's actually still alive and she lives in South Wales. And she is reputedly 39 years old. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. They haven't actually confirmed it. But if I look like this when I'm 39, I'll be really pleased. Um, she is a, I hope that laughter wasn't coming from someone in cat's protection. Um, she's a little bit of a mini mammoth. She's a bit of a, a, bit of a porker. Um, but I think she looks in pretty good nick. But um, as I said, I'm not quite sure whether it's truly confirmed that she is um, 39. I think the record before that was about 34 for the world's oldest living cat. I think he was from Texas or somewhere like that. They obviously have to have the biggest, oldest, etc. So what are the issues in having old cats in, in rescues? Cats are living longer. Veterinary medicine and diets are improving, so we are seeing more old cats. And certainly in the UK, we're getting more elderly cats coming into our shelters. But of course, many of these do have health problems. Um, obviously, cats don't die of old age. Nothing dies of old age. People don't die of old age. You might die of an age-related problem, but you don't actually die of old age. But many of these cats have problems because their organs are suffering from wear and tear, etc. So we are going to be seeing more disease in these cats. And they are much more difficult to home. We've looked at our statistics, and cats over the age of 10 take on average double the length of time to find a home compared to the ones that are under 10. So it's much more difficult to home them. And it does take a lot more in terms of time and resources to deal with these cats. And overall, as you all know, there are far too many cats needing homes. And so sometimes we have to think when we've got lots and lots of young cats that we can't home, should we actually be spending our resources on these older cats? I love this picture. Um, we run a photographic competition every year, and this was one of our winners um, about the, the very special bond that can occur between mature cats and elderly people. 
But how can we deal with this issue of more older cats coming into our care? Well, I think we have to be realistic, and I think particularly in countries where you really are struggling to home even young, healthy cats, we have to think, should we be taking older cats into our shelters? Because they can end up blocking our pens and sitting there for a long time before they get a home. And actually, is it good welfare for those cats to be sitting in a pen and never, ever getting a home? Sometimes feeling quite rough and quite poorly with age-related disease. And sometimes, certainly in the UK, we have owners who have older cats. They get diagnosed with a serious problem and they don't have the heart to actually make that hard decision and have the cat put to sleep. So they want to hand it in to a charity. And I think perhaps we sometimes need to educate people that coming into a shelter is not actually a great thing for an old cat. Often their immune system is not as good as it was when they were younger and they're going to be exposed to all these infectious diseases that we talked about yesterday. They're going to be exposed to a lot of stress. They may not get a home, particularly if they have quite a serious disease and particularly if they have something like diabetes. They may never get homed, so they might just sit in a pen until they succumb. So we have to think, should we be taking all these cats in in the first place? And certainly we may feel we can cope with some elderly cats, but I think we have to have a balanced intake because there are only a few people who are willing to take them. And so we perhaps need to think, well, we'll have some old cats, but we won't fill every pen with older cats. And I think it's very important that we do assess these cats um, thoroughly and promptly when they do come into our care. So that if we are picking up serious disease, then we do actually um, decide to euthanize them rather than just putting them in a pen until they succumb to renal failure. Um, and also then obviously all the staff get very attached to them. But if they're healthy older cats, then it is possible to home them. And actually there are a lot of positive aspects to having elderly cats, which I'll go on to in a moment. But so we can promote the benefits of mature cats. And I think sometimes it's, it's better to call them mature rather than old. Certainly that's what I call myself. Um, you can agree to pay some of the ongoing costs. Now that's something that I think we have to be very, very cautious about because you can actually end up um, sort of promising a lot to people that you can't financially sustain. So I'll say a little bit more about that later on. The last thing I've put on the list, on the slide, is sanctuary. And I've put a question mark there because I think, particularly with cats, I personally don't really agree with the idea of just keeping them in sanctuary um, for the rest of their life. I think cats need to be in a home. And certainly cats, as, as several people have mentioned um, already in the conference, cats don't like being with lots of other cats, particularly lots of other cats they don't know. And so having sanctuaries where perhaps we're keeping lots of old cats together is not necessarily a great thing for the cat. They're very stressed. And also, we can't actually monitor um, the old cats very well if they are sharing water bowls and things like this. We can't tell how much the individuals are drinking or how much they're eating. And so the idea of thinking, oh, we're great, we're not going to put them to sleep, we'll put them all in a big communal pen, um, is not necessarily doing the best thing for the cats. People have, may have varying opinions about that, but I certainly think where you know, you can have animals, perhaps like horses or sheep, that you might have in sanctuary, put them out all out in a nice field. Um, we have to think very carefully whether that sort of thing is the best thing for elderly cats. So what are the advantages of older cats? There's lots and lots of advantages. They do have a sort of developed character, so obviously a new owner knows what they're getting. So they know if it's going to be a bit feisty, they know if it's going to be gentle. And as with taking on a, a puppy, um, taking on a kitten does require a degree of work and so there's much less work if you take on a mature cat that's already house uh, litter trained, etc. They often are quieter and more sedate and so they do make great pets for elderly people or for the housebound. They do tend to wander less, they do tend to hunt a bit less, um, so that can be considered quite an advantage. And certainly there are some people who feel good about taking a cat that they perceive needs a good home. And particularly if it's a sort of healthy older cat, 
um, they might say, oh, I've taken this cat and it's 18. Um, and, you know, they can still get a year or two of good life out of that cat. Obviously, there are disadvantages, and I think the main, the main two disadvantages in terms of the shelter environment is that people taking on these cats may not have them for very long, and, and often people don't want to do that. Um, and they do require um, more veterinary treatment on average. They do need to be monitored really, really closely, and so you do have to find owners who aren't prepared to monitor them and, and obviously then take them to the vet if they do have a problem. So I'm going to say a bit about geriatric disease, and as I said earlier, I'm not trying to make you into many vets, um, but I think it's important if you are going to be looking after older cats to have some knowledge. Um, most of the age-related diseases that we see are what we would describe as chronic, and the term chronic just means that it's a long-term disease, often with a sort of slow progression. And with modern medicine and diets and care, um, a lot of these conditions can be managed quite well. The earlier they are diagnosed, obviously the more uh, we can do for the cats, the more we can get them on treatment to keep them stable. So it is important that they are assessed thoroughly and then as early as possible. And that over um, the once they're in the home and also while they are in the shelter, that they are regularly checked and regularly monitored. And the other thing that I think is really important to remember with older cats is that often they have more than one problem. And that might be something that you have to take into account is when you decide, is this a cat we're going to keep and try and rehome, or is it a cat that unfortunately we have to consider euthanasia for? So there's lots and lots of things that old cats can get. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about most of these, but I'm not going to say a great deal about dental disease um, or blindness or deafness, because I think most of you, I'm sure, have, have dealt with blind and deaf cats and know that just with a few adaptations to the home, they can actually lead really good quality lives. And any cat, whatever their age, um, should have their teeth checked before you rehome them because lots and lots of them will have dental disease and it does cause significant pain um, and problems for cats so it's really important that their mouths are checked but I'm not going to go into lots of detail about those at the moment but I'm going to say a little bit about these other diseases. Renal disease or kidney disease is very very common in cats and in old cats usually it is what we call chronic renal failure. And it's basically that it is part of the aging process. And gradually the cells in the kidneys die off um, and so the kidneys work less efficiently. Now the kidneys are pretty amazing organs and actually you can get to a level where 75% of the cells have died off before you get significant clinical signs in the cats. So by the time you see signs of, of kidney disease, already they've lost the vast majority of their kidney tissue. This damage is irreversible, so it will gradually get worse, and will deteriorate over time. And what happens is obviously the kidneys usually um, filter out a lot of the waste products from the body, and if the kidneys aren't working very well, then these waste products build up in the system and can make the cats feel very, very poorly. Um, obviously it's very difficult for us to know exactly how they feel, but if you talk to human um, patients who are on renal dialysis, if they miss a session of dialysis, they very quickly feel really, really sick and really poorly and very weak. Um, so it's, it's not a nice disease, it does make them feel pretty sick. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's where the kidneys are in a cat. You can actually feel cat's kidneys really easily. They're very mobile, very easy to feel. You might want to ask your vet to, to show you where the kidneys are, but they're, they're just under the spine. Um, and the things people tend to notice most of all with cats where they have got renal issues is that they are drinking more. And what's really important is that you have to let them drink more. Um, I used to work in, in private veterinary practice and quite often you'd have clients saying, oh, he was drinking a lot, so I picked up his water bowl, I didn't want him doing that. And the quickest way to push them into complete renal failure is to not let them have water. Um, so you will notice them drinking more and it is really important that they have access, an access that they can get to. They might also be a bit arthritic and a bit creaky, so we've got to make sure that water bowl is somewhere they can easily get it. 
Often they have a poor on appetite and they lose weight. Um, they feel very lethargic. They'll often sit there with their heads sort of hanging over the water bowl. Um, and they can get secondary effects, like they can become anemic. And as it progresses, we can get vomiting. Um, and sometimes things like ulceration in the mouth, um, really bad breath. And it, at the sort of extreme end, when they really are very sick, sometimes even having fits. And certainly when we're getting to that level, then those cats cannot be treated and really do need to be put to sleep. Um, now, how do we diagnose it? Now, really, in shelters, I would not recommend that we start doing x-rays and ultrasounds, uh, but I just really like these pictures. Um, this is a kidney that's got what's called polycystic kidney disease, and there's lots of little cysts. And on the, on the ultrasound, you can see the cysts. I just think they're really clear pictures. I'm not very good with ultrasound. Um, I'm, I have been a vet for many years, and when I trained, um, we didn't learn anything about ultrasounds, and it's all snow and a snowstorm to me. Um, but uh, these sort of kidney pictures are some of the few I can actually pick up. Um, but more generally, we would use blood tests or urine tests to diagnose renal disease. Um, so how are we going to treat kidney disease? Well, if they're very poorly, we actually need to give them fluid therapy. But again, to be honest, if we're in a shelter environment, if a cat is that sick that we need to put it on a drip, then I think we have to think whether we should actually be keeping this cat. There are lots of medications that are available to try and support the kidneys, things like giving them anabolic steroids, the sort of bodybuilding type steroids, appetite stimulants, etc. A lot of these things may not make a massive difference, so we have to think whether it's worth us actually spending the money on these sort of products. Um, and there is a drug called uh, Benazapril that certainly in the UK is licensed to treat renal disease, but there isn't a huge amount of evidence that it actually makes a huge difference. So if we're going to spend money on trying to stabilize these cats, probably the best thing you can do is actually use the special diets that are designed for cats with kidney disease. Because when we look at studies, the thing that makes the biggest difference is using these special diets that help the kidney, they basically help the kidneys to work a little bit more efficiently. They don't put quite so much strain on the kidneys. Um, so using these foods is probably a more effective way of using your funds rather than spending lots of money on lots of drugs to treat them. So in the long term what happens, prognosis just means what is the outlook for the cat. Um, and the damage is usually irreversible and, and with time it will deteriorate. But we can often keep these cats quite stabilised and they can have good quality of life often for quite some time. But you need to be guided by your vets um, when they're, they're looking at things like the blood results as to in an individual case how they're doing. Um, hypothyroidism, and this means um, a cat with an overactive thyroid gland is a really common problem in old cats in the UK. It does vary throughout the world how common this is. There's quite a lot in the States and in Australia. Um, and certainly I think we are seeing it a little bit more um, in other places in Europe as well. The thyroid um, is an organ that's in the neck. Again, you can see it in, in the picture here. Um, and it helps to control the metabolic rate. And it's the same in, in all species. Um, but in old cats, often what happens is that it becomes overactive, we're getting more of the hormone that it produces, and so everything in their body is in effect speeded up. In dogs, interestingly, they tend to get the opposite. They tend to get an underactive thyroid gland, which means that they tend to become quite sort of sluggish and overweight. It's the same in middle-aged women, sadly. Um, I'm definitely, much as I'm a cat person, I think if I was an animal, I'm probably a Labrador rather than a Siamese cat. Um, anyway, with, uh, because obviously the metabolic rate is speeded up, the sort of things we see in these cats is that they're, they're drinking a lot more, but also, and this is the thing people usually really notice, is they're eating a lot more. They're ravenously hungry, and despite that, they lose weight because they're burning up their energy so rapidly. <coughs> And often they do look what you might call hyper. They look sort of starey, they're quite vocal, they're very twitchy, they want lots of attention. And so there's quite a classic look 
um, that to these hyperthyroid cats, a bit wide-eyed, their fur is often quite spiky looking, they're often skinny but constantly crying out for food. And as it progresses, we can get other things happening, like we see them having some vomiting and diarrhea. And sometimes you can actually feel enlargement of the thyroid glands on the neck. Because of the speeding up of the metabolic rate, they also have a very fast heart rate. How do we diagnose this? It's through a blood test. And there's three ways that we can treat them. Um, most commonly, particularly initially, people tend to put them on drugs that help to decrease this overactivity. But as I'm sure most of you know, trying to give medication to cats is not always easy. So not every cat could be treated like this. And certainly in terms of the shelter and trying to home these cats, trying to home an old cat that someone needs to give tablets to two or three times a day is a pretty challenging thing. So what we tend to do, if we are going to consider it's a cat that, that we could home, is we tend to actually surgically <coughs> remove the thyroid glands. And that might sound quite a drastic thing to put an older cat through, but many of them will survive the surgery and do really well, and that means when you're trying to home them, they don't need to be homed on medication, so you're much more likely to find a home for them. There is also a form of treatment where we use um, radioactive iodine. Now, this is not something I would ever recommend for cats in shelters. It's an, an extremely expensive method of treatment. The cats need to go to special centres and have to be hospitalised quite a while because um, their faeces and urine is radioactive for a while. And so it's not a treatment that we'd ever really use with shelter cats, but it's something that's worth knowing about. Um, and in the future it may be something that's, that's cheaper and more readily available. But certainly for shelter cats, the best alternative, if your vet feels they are okay for an anaesthetic, is to actually whip those thyroid glands out. And certainly with a lot of these cats, if we can get them stable, if they survive surgery, they can do really, really well. Um, and can actually survive for quite a long time. I, I had a hyperthyroid cat myself in the past and I had her, her after diagnosis for four years, so they can actually survive and have a really good quality of life. If it's left untreated, because obviously the, the body is, is working much, much faster than normal, often the organs start to suffer and their heart or their liver can, can start to fail. So again, it's important if we are going to, to keep these cats and try and home them, we do have to actually treat them. Um, moving on to hypertension, this just means high blood pressure. Now I'm sure many of you, if you've dealt much with older cats, may have come across old cats that suddenly go blind. There's no indication before and then suddenly one day they are totally, completely blind. Um, and usually this is a result of high blood pressure and it can cause bleeding in the eyes sometimes and it can cause the retina or the, the seeing bit at the back of the eye to become detached and these cats will suddenly go completely blind which is very distressing for them. It's not like gradually going blind and they can adapt. Um, so it can be something that really is quite severe but also can have effects on other organs like the brain and the kidney. Um, so we can get things related to the organs that are being affected so they can have fits and become very disorientated or blind. And in some cases they can have high blood pressure in the way that humans can have high blood pressure without any sort of obvious signs. Um, and in an ideal world, all old cats would have their blood pressure checked. I've got a picture here of a cat having its blood pressure taken. So this little cuff. I'm sure you, most of you probably at some point have your, had your blood pressure taken. Very similar, little cuff, measuring the blood pressure there. And most cats are fairly tolerant of having it done. But interestingly, they do get what in humans we call the white coat effect. You know, that when we go in and, and we're feeling a bit anxious, our blood pressure will be higher. But it's the same with cats, and so often you need to just have them in a nice, quiet um, area of a, a clean to just let them calm down and actually take a few readings um, just to um, check that if it is high, it isn't just a sort of stress or anxiety related one. And with these cats, because sometimes there are underlying reasons like having an overactive viral gland that leads to high blood pressure, we need to often just assess there's nothing else going on. So because there can be other things um, in 
involved with this. Obviously, if we're going to, to treat these cats, we need to look at any treating any underlying conditions. Um, it can be treated with medication, but again, it, it means we have to have a cat that is amiable enough that you can actually tablet it, because it is a drug that's in tablet form called Amlodipine. It's not hugely expensive, um, so there's nothing else wrong with the cat. It is something that, that can be stabilised. Um, we can sometimes use special diets, and it's really important these cats are monitored regularly. And some of them will do very well, others won't, because if they've got other underlying problems, then sometimes those will, will catch up with them. Quickly moving on to arthritis. Now, osteoarthritis is something that I think most people tend to associate much more with dogs than cats. And you think about sort of old Labradors, old Retrievers, old Rottweilers, you know, getting bad hips and bad elbows. But in actual fact, um, osteoarthritis is really, really common in old cats. And it's only really in the last few years that I think we've really recognised what a common problem this is. And usually it's just due to wear and tear of the joints, but if perhaps they have had some accidents in the past, um, then that can also contribute to it. In dogs, the thing we tend to notice that makes us think, or oh, has this dog got arthritis, usually is that the dog becomes really lame. And this is really uncommon in cats. You don't commonly see them looking lame with arthritis. They tend to just get very stiff and have reduced mobility. They tend to have the arthritis on, on both sides, so often it's both hips or both elbows, and so they're not actually lame because they're sore on, on both sides. Um, and often it's a change in behaviour that indicates to us that there is a problem going on. I once had a client who said to me about their 14-year-old cat, at long last, after all these years, I trained the cat not to jump up on the worktops. I don't really think that's the case. The cat wants to do it, but unfortunately can't jump anymore because it's got arthritis. Um, the other thing you often notice in all cats with arthritis, arthritis is that they're not grooming themselves properly, particularly in the middle of the back. So often you get these old cats and they've got little sort of knots and clumps in the middle of their back because they can't get around to groom that. And that could be an indicator of arthritis as well. And it is painful. Cats don't show pain very overtly because in the wild they can't show themselves as vulnerable and they have to get on with things. So often this goes undiagnosed, but it can cause significant welfare issues. And most commonly we diagnose it literally as vets by having a feel of the joints and we can feel that there is restricted movement. You can do x-rays, but again, is it something that we're going to have the funds to do in the shelter environment? You can get a really good idea just from the history, you know, decreased mobility, not grooming very well and vet having a good feel. It's really important with these cats if they're overweight that we try to get some weight off them because that will make a big difference. And there are now some really good drugs that can be used in the long term. And some of them are in liquid form, so they're quite easy to give. Um, we might need to adapt the home or the pen to these cats because they can't jump up as well. Um, and so if it is a cat in a home and it might have a favorite windowsill and it can't jump up there, we might want to put a little, a little um, a chair or a stool or something there, so they've got something they can jump up on to get to the windowsill. So we can adapt our pens or adapt their home so that they can still uh, do all the things that they enjoy. Um, occasionally surgery is necessary if there's a specific problem from a previous accident, but in most cases that's not necessary. Um, and it can make quite a big difference. Um, and because some of the drugs that we use can have side effects, it is something that's worth thinking about if you know a vet um, that's trained in veterinary acupuncture. It is important that it is a vet that, that did, does this, so they are trained in the diagnosis and the, uh, obviously the right acupuncture points for, for cats or dogs. It's really important with these cats that we do treat them. I think people tend to think, oh, they're old, they're getting a bit slow. But I think we have to remember that this is a painful condition. It does cause welfare issues. And so we really should be treating it if we're picking it up. Senility. Um, 
sometimes I think I'm going senile um, and can't, can't remember things quite in the way that I used to. And we are, because our cats are living longer, we are seeing true senility in cats more. And there's all sorts of possible causes, things like changes in blood pressure or perhaps a brain tumour. Um, but it has been shown that, that um, on a sort of microscopic level, there are changes that can occur in old cats' brains that are the same as the changes that occur in patients with Alzheimer's in humans. So they can get true senility. And as with um, human Alzheimer's patients, they tend to get a bit disorientated and confused, and they tend to forget things. And often they will sort of unlearn behaviours that they've done their whole life. They might forget to use the litter tray, um, and there may be changes in their sort of grooming routine or their, their eating routine. And we diagnose it really by ruling out other problems. Um, they, we are limited in what we can do for these cats, and certainly in a shelter environment where they're in a different environment, and then we might be passing them on to a home. Again, we have to sort of think whether it's fair with these cats, particularly as it does tend to deteriorate, whether it is right to keep them in a shelter environment. But we can, by adapting their environment, you know, not moving the, the, the furniture around too much and making sure there's plenty of low-sided litter trays, that we can help them to have reasonable quality of life. But obviously, as they do deteriorate, um, if we do go to a point where, where sadly we would have to euthanize them. Um, we could have a whole lecture about cancer, so I'm only going to mention it very, very briefly. Obviously, we can get cancer in any um, body system, any organ. It's much more common in elderly cats as it is with humans, created with the feline leukemia virus. So sometimes you see it in quite young cats, um, but it isn't always, and some, it's also the most common tumour in elderly cats, often in, in areas like the gut. And the treatment of cancers in cats depends very much on where it is. You might just have a skin lump that, that can be removed and the cat's fine. But some of them may require much more aggressive therapies. And really we do have to consider, A, from a sort of financial point of view, but much more from a welfare point of view for these individuals, do we want to actually um, treat them in an aggressive way? Because often the treatment will make them feel quite poorly. And certainly in cats protection, we um, do not ever use chemotherapy in any of the cats in our care. In this picture, just out of interest, that's the tumour on the cat's nose. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that white cats or cats with white bits on them, like the, the nose of this cat, um, can get sun-related tumours, and this is a, a sun-related one in this case. So, moving on to assessing quality of life, I think it's really important that we have sort of criteria that we use so that we can assess the quality of life in all, in all the animals in our care, but I think particularly with older animals, particularly a species like cats, where they don't really readily show that they're in pain and they often are very good at hiding symptoms. So the sort of things that I would go on is I think about things like, are they eating and drinking normally? If you're really struggling to get them to eat, then they're probably feeling pretty rough. And so we're talking about arthritis, are they mobile? You know, cats should be mobile, agile creatures. Um, I really disapprove of things like putting them on trolleys if they've, they've got paralysis. Um, and I think we really should be having cats that can still jump and climb. Are they continent? Cats like to be clean. And so cats that um, can't um, urinate and that the urine is just leaking out and they're getting urine scalding around the back end. I really think that's something that is a um, poor quality of life. And it's quite difficult to keep them sufficiently dry and clean. And that's something we need to think about if we are assessing quality of life. Obviously, are they in pain? And that can be really difficult to assess in cats. Um, there are now some, there's been <coughs> recently quite a lot more research in pain in cats. And there are some quite good um, sort of photographic guides that have come out for vets that show images of the way cats in pain sit, the way they're hunched up. And so um, if any of you are interested in that, I, can, uh, I have got lots of copies with me, but I can email you some stuff about that. But I think it's really important that we do recognise when cats are in pain because they're so good at hiding it. 
Um, do they have an ongoing condition? And if they do, is it something that we can control or is it something we can cure? If we can't get the condition under control, then we have to really think about whether they've got decent quality of life. Can we give them good, uh, a good sort of mental, um, a sense of a good mental well-being? Uh, again, it's quite difficult to assess, but I think we have to remember in our sort of environment that living in a pen is not generally good quality of life. However good that pen is, it has to just be a short-term <coughs> temporary thing. Um, can we actually provide them with the stimulation that they need? Can we give them adequate medical care uh, and adequate care in other ways, suitable diets, etc.? If we can't provide that, can we give them good quality of life? And will the cat ever get home? I said being in a pen is not great welfare if it's for a length of time. So we have to think, will this cat ever get a home? Because that's where it needs to be. All those things that you have to think of, and we have to look at each individual cat because things are different in different cases, but I think these are all things that we have to consider when we're considering whether a cat has good quality of life. And most of those things, really, you could apply to dogs or lots of other species as well. So how do we assess them? Well, ideally we want as much background information as possible and if an owner is actively giving up their cat, we want to get as much history, both medical and just generally how the cat is in its home. But also we need to um, get our own information by observing the cat while it's in our care. How much is it drinking? How much is it eating? Is there any diarrhea? All that sort of information is really important, and particularly for the vet, when you take the cat to be assessed, and it's essential that these cats are assessed really well with a clinical examination by your vet. The more information they've got, the more we can get a really good idea about what's going on without doing lots of really expensive tests. Because in an ideal world, with every geriatric cat, we would check its blood pressure, we'd do some blood tests, but it does all cost a lot of money, and so we want to glean as much information as we can. So if we have lots of information about you know, eating, drinking, etc., the vet checks the cat over and doesn't find any abnormalities, then we don't need to spend lots of money doing lots of tests. But obviously in an ideal world if we have endless resources, it would be great with these cats to, to make more of an assessment. But your own observation is incredibly important. And it, I can't stress enough how you know, things like keeping lots of cats together in a pen means you cannot properly monitor and observe those cats. So finally, I'm going to move on to a few practical tips. To, um, so if you have got elderly cats in your shelters, hopefully we can um, help their quality of life as much as possible. Like old people, old cats like familiarity and routine. So we want to um, ideally have a, a daily routine so they can get accustomed to what's going to happen. We don't change things around in their pens or in their environments any more than we absolutely have to. And because they may well be a little bit less mobile, we have to sort of have all the resources that they need, things like their water bowl, their food bowl, within easy reach. Now with cats, this is quite difficult because we don't actually want to have all the resources really close together because as I'm sure you all know, a cat doesn't want to eat and drink next to its litter tray. And if the water bowl and the food bowl are next to each other, then usually it means they don't drink very much. So we want to have them as spread out as we can, but obviously it's got to be accessible. So what you don't want is to put your water bowl somewhere where the cat has to climb up um, a little sort of uh, ridge or, or little ladder or whatever because some of these elderly cats can't do it and some of them can't even get through a cat flat and so you have to make sure that all the resources are in easy reach. It is important that we mentally stimulate them so it's a quite a good thing for volunteers to do to actually play with these elderly cats and it is quite interesting that if you get um, a moving toy like you know like a fishing rod type toy that even the sort of quietest um, elderly cat often will sort of, their face will light up if you can describe a cat's face as lighting up, and they will um, you know, be quite responsive. So it's really important that we are actually stimulating them. We often need to groom them because they can't groom themselves as well as they used to be able to do. Obviously using a soft brush because they might be a bit more bony, and obviously with care because their back might be a little bit sore and then they might whip around and, and give you a nip. 
Um, I have to groom my cat quite frequently and he, he does get a little bit grumpy about it, but it's really important that we do do that for them. Want to ensure they've got lots of nice, cosy places to sleep. And as in this picture, sometimes we do need to um, put things at different levels so that they can get up to the place where they can see or they can reach food, etc. Do use low-sided litter trays because sometimes when the cats stop using the litter trays when they're older, sometimes it isn't that they've gone senile, it's they physically can't get into it. So if you've got very deep-sided litter trays, you may need to change those to, to lower-sided ones. As I keep saying, regular veterinary checkups and also really close monitoring is incredibly important for these old cats because we need to make sure that when they get to a point where quality of life has deteriorated, we don't let them go on um, and that we would euthanize them rather than letting them be in pain or discomfort. Now, certainly with some charities in the UK um, that have quite a lot of resource, sometimes when they hold home, home elderly cats, they do agree to pay some of the costs for some of the, the conditions they may have. And this is something that I would say we have to sort of enter into with a great deal of caution because if we make lots of promises to people that, oh, we're going to pay all your veterinary bills, you can soon run out of money. And if you are going to do this, I would strongly recommend that you write out very specifically what you're going to pay for because it might be that you're going to pay for that cat to have a checkup twice a year and to pay for one drug. Um, but you're not going to agree to pay for everything. So it's quite important that if we do enter into these agreements, we write them down, we get people to understand, and that we're very limited in what we agree to pay for. If we say we'll just pay for everything, then to be honest, you can really get yourself in a lot of financial trouble. So that's the end. Um,